Hi, everybody. Okay, it's Resistance Live. It's the 23rd of April, 2018. I felt like the days continue to fly by, right? Hey, uh, so uh, I did a round trip to California this week, and I'm, I have too much coffee in my body, so I'm warning you guys already that I'm a little wired. And we've had a team meeting that's been going since 8 o'clock this morning, so I'm like, you know, a little, a little vibrational this morning, which is all good. Okay, um, first things first. Thank you so much to all of our subscribers and followers on Patreon. Um, again, if you like what you see here and you want to help to support us and keep this broadcast free for everyone, you can go to patreon.com slash resistance live um, and subscribe for as little as $2 a month. There's extra bonuses over there. If you do not already support us, we would appreciate your support. Um, okay, for starters, we've had a request this morning to talk through best resistance efforts for today. And there's a couple that I want to flag for you that are very significant this week. The most important of which is tomorrow. So in the Arizona 8th, there is a very hotly contested race right now. And um, shockingly, like quite shockingly, the Democratic contender is neck and neck right now with the incumbent. Um, and so one of the things that I want to actually do today and ask you all today is to ask you to please shout out Dr. Harrell Tipernani, who is the Democratic candidate who is running for that seat. If that seat flips, let me just tell you, it is going to be a stunner for the GOP. Um, the fact that it is even neck and neck is like unbelievable. So from a special action standpoint, this is one to follow. I, would, I will make sure that we post the link um, to her website um, in the comments here and also on the feed later on today. But that is one to shout out because if she wins tomorrow, it's going to be a it's going to be a major harbinger of what's to come. So um, so pay attention to that one, and that's one to shout out. The other thing that I want to encourage all of you to think through this week is the Pompeo nomination to Secretary of State. Um, the, the Foreign Relations Committee has not endorsed him now, which is enormous. That's never happened before. Um, there are a number of targets right now to try to vote the nomination down. Now, I want to remind you all, we do not need that many people to flip on him in order for the nomination to not go through. This is the Senate, where the balance of power is now extremely small. Um, so, uh, so um, or rather, the difference between the two parties is extremely small. So Heidi Heitkamp is one of the targets that I want to shout out. One of you suggested this. Um, very very good idea to direct your efforts to Heidi to get her to vote no on Pompeo this week. Um, and, you know, again, I want to remind you all that it is in many cases the more conservative women who are flipping um, things in our direction. And I would very much encourage you to think through anyone else who you could possibly um, uh, influence here who, is, or who has not yet said that they are a no vote. Um, and we will keep you tracked on that um, very quickly uh, and throughout the week on the feed. Um, okay. We had a couple of questions here about the DNC lawsuit. So this hit the, um, the news feed when I was on the airplane on Friday afternoon. Um, the litigation is actually being handled by my old law firm, which is like very exciting. So um, Cohen Milstein, which was, it was then Cohen Milstein Hausfeld and Toll, now it's Cohen Milstein Sellers and Toll, was a place where I spent like, I want to say like four and a half, five years litigating. Um, and it, uh, it, it's a great law firm. They do very high profile, high stakes litigation, mostly from a plaintiff standpoint. And they do a lot of public interest litigation. So this lawsuit is very much in the window of what they do. The lead counsel for the case is Joe Sellers, who I personally have litigated cases with. He's like a gem of a guy in addition to being a great lawyer. Um, and so I'm feeling very optimistic about the lawsuit in general, just because I know all the people who are running it. Um, and I have a great degree of faith in the lawyers who are at the top of the pile here. Um, that, that said, there's been a lot of speculation out there in the media about whether or not this is really the best idea or why would the DNC choose to do this? And is it really going to get us very far? And what, how is it going to push the ball down the road? I mean, go look at the comparisons to Watergate, which everybody talked about, Rachel talked about on Friday night. You know, go look at the ways in which this litigation mirrors that. But I want to add one other thing here that I think a lot of people are not paying attention to with regard to this lawsuit, and that is the issue of discovery. So one of the things that's really critical to understand about the way that civil litigation works is that assuming that you make it past the motion to dismiss stage, because that's always the first thing that happens in civil litigation, the people who are on the defensive side file motions to dismiss, and they, they may be on various grounds here. I mean, look, the DNC is going after WikiLeaks and Julian Assange and you know, like various other state actors. Um, you know, I think that there will obviously be Donald Trump Jr. There will obviously be motions to dismiss from these people that will have to be briefed and litigated in front of the judge. 
But assuming that some portion of the case survives beyond that, then we get to discovery. And as I have mentioned before on this feed, the interesting thing about civil litigation is that the standard of discovery is whether or not it's relevant to the claims asserted. So discovery is the process during which you get to ask questions of the other side, you get to request documents to be produced from the other side, and you get to take depositions among other things. There's also expert testimony and other things that happen during discovery. But the vast bulk of it is that you get materials that you wouldn't otherwise have access to. And so from my viewpoint, the biggest added benefit of this lawsuit is that all the things that we already know that Robert Mueller has his hot little hands on can now be disclosed in the course of this civil litigation to the Democratic Committee, the De Democratic National Committee. That in and of itself is huge. And there is also, by the way, while sometimes there are protective orders that are entered that allow materials to be kept confidential, in this case, in a case that is so much, very much in the public interest, I'm sure that the plaintiff, the DNC, is going to try very hard to get materials disclosed without a stamp of confidential on them for purposes of civil litigation so that all of us can see what they've got. And so... You know, I am not in the naysayers category on this lawsuit at all. Um, I, it, you know, it's not, I want to be very clear about this. It's not going to get the president removed from office. That is for That is for certain. It is not part of the process of what Robert Mueller is up to. It's not part of the investigation in the Southern District of New York. But it does have a very significant benefit to it from the standpoint of the public disclosure of information, assuming that a protective order is not entered. And... What that means is that in addition to being able to seek discovery that's relevant, right? Like, let's remember, we're not in like search warrant territory with this particular litigation. It's civil. So there will be requests to answer questions under oath. Those are called interrogatories. There will be document requests for production of material related to the claims asserted about whether there was a conspiracy to interfere in the U.S. election. And there will be depositions taken, which will, I would bet your bottom dollar, they're not always taken on video, but my bet is here, they will all be taken on video. And assuming that there's not a protective order over those, those videotapes can be made public. So in the larger campaign to cure what ails our country right now, this is a very significant step in the right direction. And I want to remind you all that it's not like we have to pick and choose options here. Right? Like a multi pronged assault when we're dealing with, in any event, what we have come to refer to as the Hydra of the experience of Trump and company and the, the corruption and um, the conspiracy and everything else that has happened here, <coughs> excuse me, with regard to the election and beyond, we need a multi pronged front to address that. So I am very much in favor of what has happened here with regard to the DNC. And I will just add that. Um, Y'all may not know the lawyers who are handling this case, but they're like the best lawyers in the country, among the best lawyers in the country, no question. You know, these are also, by the way, I will just add, they're class action lawyers. These are people who have done exactly the same kind of work for a living that Michael Avenatti does. And class action lawyers, I was one for like eight years, longer than that, 10 years, um, I will tell you, are cut from a particular cloth. You know, we tend to be very aggressive in the way that we pursue litigation. We're not afraid of taking risks. We're not defense attorneys. I did that too for a while. You know, like that's, those are my Wall Street days. But, you know, the, the reality is here that if you, if you are filing a lawsuit that is designed to challenge something as significant as interference in the U.S. election on behalf of one of the major parties in this country, you want people like this running that litigation. They're like the top of the top. And so... You know, th these are also people I just want to add, they don't take on frivolous cases. These are people who take on cases that they know they can win because apart from anything else, most of the time they're doing them with the assumption that they're going to be paid out of what's recovered. It's not exactly what's called a contingency in class action cases. There are other ways in which you get paid. That's another whole story. But chances are very good here that they're not being paid by the hour by the DNC. And that means that they've got their own asses on the line as lawyers to try to push the litigation forward just so they get paid. And they don't like to take that risk lightly. So we are in a very uh, good position with regard to this lawsuit. I would encourage all of you who are listening to people out there who are saying this is some bullshit to disregard that. Okay, this is not that. This is actually a very smart effort by the DNC to be another part of the effort to address what is wrong in this country and what happened in the 2016 election. So that now I'm going to get off of my uh, now I'm going to get off of my uh, my um, 
my little high horse on that front today. Um, okay. Uh, I had a call to talk about Hannity and the breaking news that came through last night and this morning about Hannity and uh, housing and urban development. So I haven't been able to dig as deeply into this one as I would ordinarily do from a legal standpoint, but I can tell you what we know, which is that Hannity has like apparently refinanced a series of loans using HUD that arguably could benefit him into like tens of millions of dollars personally. Now, the thing that I want to flag about this for you without going into the details of whether or not it's a crime or there's anything else that's happened here is that without, a, without question, the one thing we do know from what we've seen from the reporting before is that it's yet another layer of deep corruption between Fox News and Hannity himself um, and this administration. Because you got to ask a question, which is like, how does Sean Hannity get to refinance through Ben Carson loans that could personally benefit him up to $90 million or more? How does that happen, right? It's a, the story as it's developing looks very weird. The optics of it are very weird. And you know, the question here that I think we all need to be asking ourselves is what, what really is the nature of the relationship between Sean Hannity as like the premier broadcaster, so to speak, I put that in quotes, the premier entertainment newsman <laughs> um, of Fox News and Trump and this administration. And we do not know all the details of this yet. Michael Cohen is in the mix with this, by the way, up to his eyeballs. And that's one of the things that we definitely need to keep an eye on here because Sean Hannity would not be asking for the, you know, his name to be kept out of this, that, you know, his lawyers advocate to an appeal level if necessary to not have his name disclosed, only to have it disclosed in court as we saw last week. If he didn't have something to hide that was likely documented in Cohen's materials that were seized by the feds. I want to remind you all as well that Sean Hannity, when he talked about how, you know, like Michael Cohen had given him legal advice, said that it was in relation to real estate deals. So the question about housing and urban development and these mortgages that have been refinanced is, is that what was happening? That Michael Cohen was playing a conduit between Sean Hannity and Ben Carson through Trump to make money? Like there's that right there is corruption. You know, especially if he's getting a benefit that isn't available to everybody else. Um, for and, and, and then the question is raised, in exchange for what? Like, is it in exchange for favorable news coverage? Is it in exchange for propaganda? Like, what's the quid pro quo of that, right? You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. We've got an ally. Um, you know, so there's a lot more to be developed there and we will have to see. Um, but again, that is something that I, we really do very much want to keep an eye on. Okay, last major issue for today, um, and it's a big one, it is, um, is like Tweet Storm 2018. <laughs> Not that that hasn't been ongoing since January 1st, but we had a particularly chaotic and crazy weekend that has extended into this morning uh, of tweets from the president that are like utterly unhinged. And, you know, I, I know that I've said that before, but I'm, I'm laying an extra level on it today that... Um, it's crazy making. Like I said on Twitter last night, like just somebody take his phone away. I mean, it just, it, the, the anxiety that it induces in people with, you know, the level of um, what we're seeing from a chaos standpoint, even right now in our government and in international events and in everything else that's going on with this, like the man it needs to have his phone removed from his hand. Um, I will just reiterate to all of you though, what I have said about this before, which is that the closer we get to the end of this, the crazier he's going to become. And the question is, how is that going to be contained, if at all? Um, extinction bursts are real. We have talked about extinction bursts on this broadcast a number of times. What we are seeing in the experience of what he did over the weekend, you know, like throwing people under the bus, right? Referring to Sam Nunez as like a drunk, drug, drugged out loser who, by the way, that Sam Nunez has now testified in front of Mueller's grand jury in D.C. Um, you know, going after the like going after Maggie Haberman, who, by the way, he's been photographed with in the Oval Office saying that he had nothing to do with her and he doesn't speak to her. Like she's the designated premier interviewer of him for The New York Times and she just won the frickin Pulitzer Prize. Like the chaos of where, where we are right now in terms of his tweeting is a sign of how degraded he has become in his capacity to control the narrative and in his capacity to get his narcissistic needs met. So again, you know, even I am subject to this. I definitely had a moment last night where I was like, just make it stop. I want to remind you all that 
This is in some sense entirely predictable. That doesn't mean it's less than crazy making, but it's also really important to remember that this is part of the pattern of what we need to expect as we approach the end. Um, and I wish I could answer the question that you all keep asking me of, you know, are we there yet, mom? We're not there yet, but you know, I will tell you that literally everybody who I follow <laughs> um, on Twitter and everywhere else and all the people that I talk to behind the scenes about this do think we're on the way to the end. So that's the good news now. Um, there's really no easy exit for this president at this point, and uh, we, will, we will have to get prepared for more of the same until we get to the end of this. Um, all right, so that's it for today. There's a lot more that I could, you know, talk about, you know, Barbara Bush's funeral, Melania sitting next to Obama looking very happy, what the end result of that's likely to be. I don't even get me started. I'm like waiting. Um, but there's way more. <laughs> there's way more that we could be talking about from what happened over this weekend, but I'm going to leave it at that for today. I want to remind you all once again that like your self-care matters right now. Please take care of yourselves. Decompress, step away from the phone. I myself have been subject to this over the weekend where I was like, I'm overwhelmed. I have to put my phone down. Um, please do that because this week is likely to be just as intense as last week. There's a lot more that still needs to be decided in these many ongoing fronts of investigation, litigation, and various other outcomes at this point. We're all waiting to see if Cohen is going to flip. All the predictions at this point, even from inside the White House, are that that's going to happen. And it could have happened already and we just don't know about it yet. So stay tuned. Um, uh, if you like what you see here, please do support us on Patreon. Patreon.com slash Resistance Live for as little as $2 a month. And I will also just add, for those of you who, who are interested in our revamped RISE program, we talked about this a little bit on the broadcast last week. We are going to be announcing the revamp of that later on this week at um, a, a series of various, uh, much more affordable price points, because we know there's a lot of you out there who want access to this program, and we're going to make that available. So stay tuned. There will be more on that tomorrow and into the rest of the week. Um, and at last thing, we are one week away now from Gaia Women Lead, our annual conference in Santa Barbara next week. I'm very excited about that. Uh, Colette Flanagan, the founder of Mothers Against Police Brutality, is keynoting there, along with a whole series, Dr. Bandy Lee from Yale, who was the editor of The Dangerous Case of Donald Trump. Uh, it's going to be a hell of a week next week. Please stay tuned for that. And um, we're going to endeavor, to some extent, to broadcast some of that over Facebook Live to the extent that we can. All right, lots of love to all of you, and I will talk to all of you tomorrow regular time. All right, thanks. Bye.